yelling at them from the top of the pit about how stupid they were for getting so close to the edge, it does no good. Condemning them to spend the rest of their life in the pit because they deserve it for being dumb enough to walk so close to the edge, that does no good. And it's the opposite of Jesus. Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn, but to what? Do you remember? But to save. Now, so often, I think we tend to see saving in just the ultimate sense of Christ coming to save us from what Adam brought upon us, to rescue us from death and from the grave. But listen, all through life, there are lots of opportunities for saving in all sorts of ways, like people needing rescued, saving from pits they've fallen into, either from slipping into or even if they've jumped headlong into it. And when they're in that pit, we can either bring comfort or not. We can do some condemning or saving. Listen carefully to these words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This passage is a massive source of hope and encouragement for me as Paul talks about grief and sorrow over the death of loved ones and the fact that we are able to grieve with hope. We don't grieve like those who have no hope. We have hope, the certainty of resurrection in the future. Now I'm going to read from Young's literal translation, so it might be worded a bit different than you and I are used to. He says this, I do not wish you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that ye may not sorrow, as also the rest who have not hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so also God, those asleep through Jesus, he will bring with him. For this to you we say in the word of the Lord, that we who are living, who do remain over to the presence of the Lord, may not precede those asleep. Because the Lord himself, in a shout, in the voice of a chief messenger, and in the trump of God, shall come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are living, who are remaining over, together with them, shall be caught away in clouds to meet the Lord in air. And so always with the Lord we shall be. So then comfort ye one another in these words. Now today, we're not going to dig into details about the resurrection, eschatology, end time stuff, that sort of thing. What I want us to focus on is what Paul tells us in verse 18. He says, so then comfort ye one another in these words. Comfort one another. Now, the truth is that a time of grief over the death of a loved one is not the only time we need comfort Living life right here and now in what Scripture describes as this present evil age, it's filled with times of sorrow, struggles, and hardship for all sorts of reasons, whether it's reaping from our own poor choices, which we talked about not long ago, or because of hurt inflicted upon us by other people, governments, or whatever, or disasters such as earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, or the economy or the pain and hurt and distress from strained relationships, sickness, accidents, and on and on we could go making a list of things that place people like you and me in the position of needing to be comforted because life is hard and life hurts. Now, if we all need comfort and we are encouraged to be comforting one another, we've got to ask, what does it mean to comfort? Well, here's some definitions of the English word comfort. To give strength and hope. To ease the grief or trouble of. Strengthening aid. Hmm, Those are some great definitions. The Latin word that comfort comes from means to strengthen greatly. So let those definitions and that word origin sink in. To ease grief, to ease trouble, to bring hope, to strengthen greatly. So we're to strengthen one another, bring hope to one another, ease the trouble of one another, ease the grief of one another. That's what it means to comfort one another. Here's some synonyms of comfort. Assure, cheer, console, reassure, soothe. Now, sometimes I think a good way to understand what a word means is not just to look at its definitions or synonyms, but to look at what it doesn't mean. So carefully listen to this list of antonyms and what Merriam-Webster calls near antonyms. These words are what comfort is not. Distress, torment, torture, trouble, demoralize, discourage, dishearten, fret, upset, worry, aggravate, intensify, worsen, annoy, irk, 
irritate, harass, and pester. Now, hopefully in our interaction with one another and others, we never make it our aim to do any of those things that I just read, to bring distress or torment or torture or to demoralize or discourage or to dishearten, right? That's not what we're to do. However, I know that even when we have the best of intentions, sometimes it happens and we might not even realize it. As I think about bringing comfort or not, the person that comes to my mind is Job and his friends. Remember, Job, the poor guy had lost everything. He lost his children, all of them, in a day. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. Everything was gone. His health got so bad. He had gnarly, pus-filled sores all over his body. And he was sitting out in a trash heap, scratching himself with broken pieces of pottery. The Bible even tells us that his breath became incredibly horrific. Now listen, if the Bible says your breath is bad, it's bad. Just like when the Bible says a woman is beautiful, she is extremely beautiful. Or a man is handsome, he's got to be incredibly handsome. So when it said that Job had foul breath, his breath was way beyond morning breath. It was disgusting. So he had these pus-filled sores, repulsive breath, scratching himself with broken pottery, after losing all of his wealth, and on top of that, he is grieving the loss of his children. So some of Job's friends hear about what happened to him, so they decide to pay him a visit. And after finding Job out on the trash heap, they just sat there with him. And they said nothing for a week, but they did weep and tear their robes when they first saw him because it broke their hearts. It was such a shocking sight to see him in such misery, this man who had everything now with nothing. And so they, they wept. It broke their hearts. And then they just sat there quietly for seven days. And you know what? That was probably a good thing. Sometimes just being with someone in their time of hurting can be a great comfort weeping with them. Paul tells us to weep with those who weep. That is part of bringing comfort. For a person to know that they are not alone, to see you there by their side after their world has fallen apart, that can be a great thing. It is a strengthening thing for them to know, I'm not alone in this. I have friends who are here with me. And in Job's circumstance, that's what he needed. But after a week of sitting there quietly, staring at Job, seeing him in his condition, reasoning it out in their minds, his friends came to some conclusions about Job's circumstances, and like most of us, they decided to help poor old Job out by trying to fix him. In other words, they decided to let Job know exactly why all of this calamity had come upon him, and boy, oh boy, did they begin to tear into poor old Job, laying all sorts of trips on him, basically saying that everything that happened was all Job's fault. After all, the reasoning went, if a man is living a halfway decent life, there is no way that God would allow this kind of stuff to happen to him. The misery in Job's life had to be because he was living in some sort of sin and rebellion against God, right? So God must be punishing him. Well, they were wrong about that, as you discover when you read the book of Job. But after letting them spew out their helpful words, Job finally decided to speak up. And you know what he said? He said this, miserable comforters are you all. Miserable comforters. He didn't say you guys are great comforters. He said, you know what, my friends, you guys are miserable comforters. He had this group of buds, right? And they all spoke up about what was going on, telling him exactly why he was having these problems. But none of them really knew what they were talking about. And none of them had an idea of how to comfort. Remember the definitions of comfort from a few minutes ago? To give strength and hope to. To ease the grief or trouble of. It is strengthening aid. The words Job's friends spoke to him were pretty much the antithesis of that. Their words were those antonyms we looked at a few minutes ago. They were distressing, demoralizing, discouraging, disheartening, annoying, irritating, and really torturous for poor old Job. Think about it. Even if they had been right in what they were saying, which they weren't, even if the things they said about Job were true, would rubbing Job's nose in it or reminding him of his weaknesses and failures or pointing out all they could find wrong with the guy, would any of that have accomplished anything of value? As you consider that, put yourself in Job's shoes for a minute and ask yourself, 
Would having people talk to you in that way have eased your grief and trouble and brought you strength? Well, Job, the reason your kids all died in one day is because you... Oh my goodness, plug anything in there and it isn't going to bring comfort. It's going to tear them down even more. Job, it's all your fault that you lost all of your wealth because of... Oh man, even if it had been his fault, again, which it wasn't, put yourself in those shoes and ask how much comfort would come to you from friends rubbing your nose in your mistakes that cost you everything you owned. Job, those pus-filled, gooey, disgusting sores on your body and that gross condition that's giving you the repulsive breath, well, that's all your fault because oh, miserable comforters are you all. Let me ask you, is that what you would have wanted them to be saying to you? Is that how you would have wanted them to approach you? Would your response to them have been the same as Job? Miserable comforters are you all. You're no help to me at all. As I think about their interaction with Job and how we ought to interact with one another in times of difficulty, Christ said something very simple that should govern the way we approach it. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that sounds so simple. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Oh, simple. Sounds simple. But have you noticed that in some circumstances, it's really hard and it goes against the grain of our fleshly nature. But if we were in the shoes of the downtrodden, we sure wouldn't want someone beating us up over our condition. When we come across someone else in those shoes, there's a tendency within us to want to make sure that other person knows exactly why they are in the shape they are in. Somehow we've got the convoluted idea that we're lifting them up and helping them by going over and over and over how they've messed up. That if we really make them aware of the root of what they've done wrong, oh, then we're, we're doing our job. And so we, we go over those things and over them again, and then we walk away thinking we've helped them. When in reality, we've left them right where they are, or maybe even in a worse state, because odds are, if it had come upon them because of things they had done, they already know that. They already feel horrible about it. And us approaching them the way we typically do as human beings doesn't help. I mean, think about your own life. When you have made bad choices and you've reaped rotten consequences, you realize it, didn't you? Did it help when other people came along and just rubbed your face in it? Probably not. And as you look back over your life and as you see those places where you were in great need of comfort for whatever reason, as you look back, how would you have liked people to approach you? How would you have liked people to talk to you? In those times, what would have brought the most comfort, the most hope, the most strength? Now, as you look back on those times, learn from them. And as you consider how you would have wanted people to treat you, remember what Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And as we look forward and we look at where we're at presently and people whose paths are going to cross ours in the future, we then try to apply it. Now, again, it's hard, especially when it comes to dealing with someone who may have brought the antithesis of comfort to us at one point. Because there's that thing within us as human beings where we want payback. We want vengeance. Oh, boy, when I was down, Billy Bob sure did tear into me. Oh, now that I heard he's hit rock bottom, I'm going to let him have it. He's got it coming. I want to show him just how it feels. Uh-oh. That's the flesh. When we slip into that mode, miserable comforters are we. My friend, I don't know about you, but when I am down, when it seems I've hit bottom, during a time of sorrow and grief or in a time of reaping from my own foolishness, which can also bring sorrow and grief, just like it has in your life. During those times, I hope for and long for someone to come along with sympathy. Someone who realizes that whatever happened to me could just as easily have happened to them. I'd want someone to not be pointing a finger but instead to extend a hand. I mean, think about it. When a person has fallen down, are they helped at all by having people point at them? Nope. If they've fallen down, they need someone to reach out with that hand. Not to point with that hand, but to reach out, grab hold, and pick them up. If a person has fallen in a deep pit, 
yelling at them from the top of the pit about how stupid they were for getting so close to the edge. It does no good. Condemning them to spend the rest of their life in the pit because they deserve it for being dumb enough to walk so close to the edge. That does no good. And it's the opposite of Jesus. Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn, but to what? Do you remember? But to save. Now, so often, I think we tend to see saving in just the ultimate sense of Christ coming to save us from what Adam brought upon us, to rescue us from death and from the grave. But listen, all through life, there are lots of opportunities for saving in all sorts of ways, like people needing rescued saving from the pits they've fallen into, either from slipping into or even if they've jumped headlong into it. And when they're in that pit, we can either bring comfort or not. We can do some condemning or saving work, like lowering down a rope and maybe even climbing down into that pit with them to pick them up if they're too weak to grab hold. That would do some good, wouldn't it? And I think it would be pretty Jesus-y if we really did it. Now, let me get back onto words of comfort because Paul said comfort one another with these words. A while back, I read an article on the ministry of comfort and I jotted down a quote from a guy named J.R. Miller. Actually, I jotted down quite a few quotes from him. I don't know anything about J.R. Miller other than his birth year and death year. In case you're curious, he was born in 1840 and died in 1912. Here's some of what he said about comfort. He said, it is worth our while to learn what comfort is and how we can speak tenderly to others. No ministry is more needed or finds more frequent opportunity for exercise. Those who would be wise and comforting must be sympathetic. They must be patient with even the smallest griefs of others. Indeed, weakness of this kind needs comfort that will cure it and transform it into strength. Sympathy, to be truly rich and adequate in its helpfulness, must be able to enter into every form of suffering. Enter into it, like getting into that pit. It must be able to enter into every form of suffering, even the smallest, and to listen to every kind of complaining and discontent, to every fear and anxiety, however needless. End quote. Think about this, my friend. A child, a toddler, weeping over losing a teddy bear at the grocery store might seem needless to you as an adult, but it is not needless to the child. Even if the child lost the teddy bear over his or her own bad decision or disobedience to mommy and daddy by taking it into the store in the first place after being told to leave it in the car, it's not a needless thing. That child to them has lost a great friend, and we need to be mindful of that. It's heartbreaking for the child. The child needs comfort. To an adult, again, it might seem needless, but it is needed to that person. Here's another quote from J.R. Miller as he spoke of Jesus bringing comfort. He said, It was thus that Christ condescended to all human frailty. He never treated anyone's trouble, however small, or anyone's worry, however groundless, with lightness, as if it was unimportant. He bade to come to him all who were weary, receiving graciously every one who came. He was infinitely strong, but his strength was infinitely gentle to the weakest. Nothing in this world is more beautiful than the sight of a strong man giving his strength to one who is weak, that he may help him to grow strong. Man, is that good stuff or what? Here's another quote from this Miller guy. Listen closely. When we give comfort to others, we are not merely to let them know that we are their friends and are sorry for them. Man, I've heard that in my life. I want you to know, man, I'm your friend and I'm sorry about what you're going through. We've all said that to people. And he says, it's not about just letting them know we're their friends and we're sorry for them. And then he goes on. We are not just to try in some way to alleviate their pain. It is not enough that we in some measure relieve their distress. We are to seek to have them grow strong so that they can endure the trouble and rejoice in it. This should be our aim in our ministry of comfort to others. We have not finished our work with them. Therefore, until... We have brought them some divine truth which will cast light on their sorrows, which will inspire them with hope 
and courage. Did you hear that last part? It's not our job to put people down and condemn them and make sure they understand how much of a mess they are or whatever. He said this, we have not finished our work with them until we have brought them some divine truth which will cast light on their sorrows, which will inspire them with hope and courage. One last quote from Miller. This is huge. The comforter needs gentleness, for a harsh word would make the sorrow deeper. He needs patience, for grief yields slowly even to the most faithful love. He needs faith. He must believe in God, must know Him, and be sure of God's love. Then he will know how to sustain with words him who is weary. My friend, for much of my life, I don't think I was a very good comforter because I really didn't understand the heart and the love of God. I ask you to pray for me, and I'm going to be praying for you that we would both become better comforters. My name is James Flanders. Thank you for patiently bearing with me today, as I know I took a few rabbit trails, but even so, I hope those rabbit trails were encouraging, comforting, and useful. Be blessed, my friend. Be blessed.